Welcome back to the Animator Guild podcast, where we talk about the creative process, respond to audience questions, and explore big ideas which cannot fit into ordinary YouTube videos. This is part two of my conversation with StoryBrain. We pick up where we left off with episode nine of this podcast. Make sure to check out the first part if you haven't already. It will be linked below. Garrett Ennis is a researcher and vlogger who focuses on how our minds respond to stories and entertainment. His YouTube channel, StoryBrain, is an underappreciated treasure trove of great ideas which I suggest you visit and subscribe to after listening to this podcast. So please enjoy the rest of my conversation with Garrett Ennis, aka StoryBrain. What do you think about a film's ability to be controversial? Do you think that's a big thing? Like, I like to try and make films that simulate discussion, yeah, that ask questions and things like that. And I find that those films are very satisfying to me when, when I leave the film, maybe not in total agreement with the film or with the film's huh. characters, but thinking like, at least I'm arguing in my head, like it's provoked some kind of thought. Do you ever yeah. think that? Yeah. Well, there's two different ways you can look at that. There's one where you can be political and then you just take off half your audience. But it'll, it'll get you some more attention, but half the audience won't see it because they don't want to hear anybody's opinion who disagrees with them on politics. It's just too annoying for people. But another way to look at that is not being political, but interesting people and things about your story because it's a little ambiguous or controversial in that way. Yeah. The example that I used in the video was The Shining. When you do it well, okay, this is the kind of thing that it's interesting because you can you want to know how it works because if you don't, you kind of run a risk of making your movie worse or whatever you're making worse. You don't want to leave up in the air how your movie ends or anything the audience wants to actually know. Yeah. The audience wants to know if the hero survived or if not or whatever it is you want them to care about, they know what happened. So with The Shining, for example, we know that the wife and the mother, the, the wife and the son, uh, son escaped. We know they're out there alive. We know that Jack essentially got killed. So he's not a threat to them anymore. So all the things you wanted to know are relieved. So you're satisfied. Yeah. But he doesn't tell you everything. Yeah. You yeah. don't know what happened to Jack and why he went crazy. You don't know about the shining, all of the details there. Exactly. So he so he gives you the end you want, but he zooms in on that picture with him in the picture and doesn't tell you why. Yeah. My favorite example of that, which, which he almost certainly took from Kubrick, was Christopher Nolan's spinning top ending. Oh, at of, the end uh, of um, Inception. Inception. Yeah, yeah and, that's my favorite one. But I think that it wobbles at the end. And in the, I, if I recall <laughs> correctly, when he was in the dream, it never stopped. It never wobbled. Well, ev everyone is watching that spinning top by the end so closely Into, to just yeah. see if there's a wobble. And it's like, yeah. I, I saw a tiny little wobble. And that put the doubt in my mind. And later that on, that made I, me think it was real. That, yeah, that he, okay. had, he had spun the top, but he wasn't in a dream. Because in my mind, I don't I haven't seen the movie in a while. When you spin the top, it in the in the dream, it just never wobbles. It doesn't wobble at all. Right, but in in the end, when he spins it, it wobbles at the end. So I think that means <laughs> that he wasn't in a dream anymore. But that's that's the benefits you get, right? Is you can talk about it. Yeah, like I I had a big discussion with my film teacher when I was at university, and yeah. he was convinced that he was still in a dream, and he gave more <laughs> answers to back it up. But those answers could be like I think with a less competent film director, yeah. uh, those could just be mistakes. But yeah. with Nolan, they probably have been considered. The things like the the two kids when they turn around, they they have the same clothes on. They're in the same exact oh, positions as as his fantasy, right? Yeah, and they haven't not... they haven't aged at all. Like he's been away for like what a year, maybe two years, yeah. maybe three, and they haven't Wasn't he aged like, at all. He was at like the lowest dream level, right? So he could yeah. have apparently been gone forever. But yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, like <laughs> I'd have to watch it again to 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 remember most of it. Yeah, but yeah. It, I hope we didn't spoil Inception there. I mean, it's been out for oh, a yeah. long time, so you should yeah, have watched I mean, it. It's, it's great. Yeah, there's, there's a statute of limitations on that. <laughs> yeah. We kind of have to accept it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's, that's, that's something that's really powerful. I think that the trick is just to make sure you, you people know how the movie ended, but you want to hit people with something else at the end that they can think yeah. about. Citizen Kane is a great example of that, too. Uh, yeah. At the end of Citizen Kane, okay, I don't want to... Citizen Kane is made in 1941, so, okay, it's like 78 <laughs> years old, okay? No, spoilers! At, <laughs> at the, okay, I'll say this. At I'm joking, I'm joking. Kane, at the end of Citizen Kane, you know what Rosebud was. 
Yeah. But you just but you don't know what it meant. Yeah. So that's another example. Is that something that you can talk about and think about? But but it's not. It doesn't leave up up in the air the things that you want to know. And it shows you that a lot of these tricks and techniques can seem like they're magical or that they're really hard to do, and they can be easy to mess up. But it's just because you need to learn how to do them correctly. Yeah. Once you learn how to do things correctly, you can recreate that thing you want to recreate from a movie or have or do it your own way and have it work. Yeah, like, I, I think it's, it, it is easier said than done, for sure, to do any of yeah. these things that we're talking about. Yeah, like like I said, I'm working on the, the, the video on nonlinear storytelling now. Mm. Everybody in the 90s was, was trying to make movies that were out of order or that somehow copied some of the style from Quentin Tarantino's movies, and a lot of them didn't do it well. Mm. But a couple of them did it fantastically well. Like Memento, Christopher Nolan's first movie. Oh, I love Memento, yeah. Unbelievably good movie. I, One of the best I've I ever seen. I tell my students to watch Memento to learn about video editing. Yeah. Because Christopher Nolan literally teaches you about video editing theory, like montage theory, in his films. It's amazing. Yeah, and, and the way he puts you in the experience of the guy, he did it in such a way that you don't, you have the amnesia essentially too while you're watching. You yeah, don't know what happened exactly. before. It's like my brilliant. favorite quote from that is um I'm he's cha- chasing I, me yeah I'm yep. chasing him no wait no, no he's, he's chasing, chasing me, me. <laughs> that's a perfect example and, I, and, I, and that's an example of something that people often do wrong when they make a movie is the, the way I boiled it down is you want your concept to cause the plot and you want your lesson to, to cause the plot to end the story starts with the concept and ends with the lesson that's interesting and, I've never heard of yeah. that actually Oh, I, I made it up. But, um, <laughs> oh, that's why I haven't heard of it. <laughs> yeah, I made it up because I noticed it from just watching a lot of movies. Everything springs from that concept. When he, you know, the fact that he's being chased by that guy and you don't know if he's chasing him and so on comes from the fact that we don't that, from the whole amnesia thing. Yeah. So, an example of the opposite is like my family, for example, doesn't watch movies with me a lot because sometimes I'll ruin them because I'll mention something about how it doesn't work. <laughs> but so usually I don't say anything. But there's a there's there was a, a TV show about a spaceship that was headed to another planet a long way away right and on the spaceship in the first episode somebody gets killed right and they're trying to find out who killed them and i just mentioned casually this isn't interesting because it's not it doesn't come from the concept Mm. you can get somebody could get killed anywhere you start watching the show you want to see stuff that's caused by your concept you want to say you want to see maybe maybe the oxygen level gets low on the ship yeah. Or maybe something comes up and attacks the ship, or maybe there's an asteroid in the way. It's all stuff that might happen if you're on that ship. So you want all your ideas to be caused by the concept. And and that's a great example of that. Memento was a great example of that. Well, I just, because you mentioned spaceship, I just thought of a good example that I, I just thought of there, which is 2001 Space Odyssey. Oh my God, yeah. And like how the malfunctions on the ship are caused by HAL. And yeah, like everything yeah. is revolving around that thing about humans depending on technology, and it all ties in with the theme. And the monolith? Yeah, the monolith. Yeah, it goes a lot of different places, and you can say a lot of different stuff about that movie, but it, it, it definitely all comes from the thing that he, he imagined yeah. or that Kubrick wanted to talk about. But um, th- the thing about nonlinear storytelling, Memento was a great example of it, and there's another movie that's a fantastic example of it, and it's one of the best movies I've ever seen, and a lot of people haven't watched it. It's Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. Dude, I love that film. <laughs> Big fan. Yeah. yeah. Screenwriters love Charlie Kaufman. Yeah, yeah, um, he's amazing. He is. And that movie, when I saw that movie, like, I didn't know a movie could affect you like that. Like, I was in, like, a completely weird state of mind for several days. I watched that film with my girlfriend. That was an interesting uh, experience. Yeah, Yeah, you may or may not want to do that. (laughs) Well, it was, it was like, it was actually good. I I remember the experience not being uncomfortable. My girlfriend at the time, it was a while ago. But that was, like, it's it's so honest. It is. And I, I wonder if that's something that's, like, a factor in films because i i know great films that don't appear to be particularly honest they're not yeah they're not true to true to life and charlie kaufman yeah. talked about that i did that in that, that video about kaufman's folly he made a speech wrote, about honesty he did, didn't he he did he said some movies he saw were damaging and they, they gave him improper expectations about the world yeah and that that's true i mean people might get mad at me for saying this but the marvel movies are really entertaining yeah. but they can do that to you yeah yeah you know like in those scenes, you watch somebody like Tony Stark, who's a genius and rich and yeah. cool and funny and, and saves the world. That's not that's not a real human being. You can't be all that. Yeah. You know, there's there's trade offs to everything in the world. You know, like you might be somebody like me and you might love researching and learning a whole bunch of stuff. But at the same time, you're not good at meeting people and relating to people. And that can become a problem. But, you know, mm. there's trade offs to everything. 
I'm, you know I wonder you're... if that's a, a problem with that films have, or if it's a problem that we have internalizing films. Because like I, I read a, a book series by a writer called Con Igledon, and they were all about yeah. they were all about Julius Caesar, and they were like yeah. chronicling his life, but in a very entertaining way. Like he did take liberties to make it more entertaining. But like uh. after reading those books, I would, <laughs> I would think to myself, what would Julius Caesar do? in this situation because he was just such a badass in those books and i was like i want to be like a badass like so it actually helped me to have a point of reference of someone yeah. who you know yeah does what he wants all the time um, unless you can't do what julius caesar would do well no i wouldn't i i wouldn't do exactly what he would do but like even if i yeah. just took a little bit of that like five percent it gives you more confidence of that charisma yeah yeah, yeah that, that that definitely can help you yeah. But a lot of times those movies, they make you think you can get away with stuff that you can't get away with in real that's, life. That's true. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. You know, like it doesn't matter how good you are at your job or what you have to say that might be interesting. If you're a douchebag, people aren't going to want you around. Yeah. Very true. You know? Like there's a lot of shows where people like I like the movie Good Will Hunting, mm. but there's no way in hell Gerald Lambeau would have put up with that guy. <laughs> yeah yeah you know it's just it's just it the world doesn't work like that <laughs> yeah they they stretched that character and that idea mm -hmm. to i suppose it's like they stretched it as like further than it would actually go realistically yeah. just to see just so they could have those conversations yeah like the conversation it, where he's like oh you're just a kid you know like yeah yeah they, they wouldn't you wouldn't be able to sit them both down for a long enough time next to each other to have no that. they couldn't they couldn't stand each other he wouldn't he wouldn't have wanted him or he wouldn't have been able to be around with people acting like that yeah true but it's interesting too because to me i like that movie i thought it was well written but what was interesting to me about that movie is i wanted to know what ben affleck and matt damon thought a brilliant mathematician would be like <laughs> yeah that to me was more interesting than than studying the character was studying what what their opinions of that type of person would be yeah yeah so they, they did have a few misconceptions if i remember rightly like yeah nobody would have put up with that he they don't show him studying math enough I, yeah. people say they have from reading math and books and stuff in the beginning but to get to the level where you're that good you have to be talented but you also have to really love what you're doing for a really long time yeah those misconceptions on talent are also a thing that's in art a lot you know like yeah. there's this very famous illustrator called kim jung gi like people pretty much recognize him everywhere as like one of the top illustrators or perhaps the yeah. most skilled illustrator and mm -hmm. they see him as like being a prodigy like the yeah. Id the stereotypical idea of a prodigy because they only see him drawing at the current level he's at yeah. but you only need to look a little bit beyond that to see that no the reason why he's so good is because he draws all the time and he's actually yeah. hired staff to like I'm not sure if they're his family members or if they're actually people he's he's paid, but like they handle everything else in his life so that he can sit yeah, down yeah. and draw every hour of every day. That's amazing. <laughs> you know, like that's a, that's a dream. Like because I've seen him in. I went to California and I actually saw him at a convention. Uh -huh. And most artists at the convention, they're shaking hands with people. They are uh, posing for photos. They're doing all of the stuff that comes with being at a convention yeah he was sat at the table drawing was he drawing four people or just for himself he was drawing he was drawing four people they were oh. paying him like you know like yeah you could get you could get his book and you could draw in the front cover of your book for like yeah i don't know 200 bucks or whatever it should be uh -huh. like a thousand bucks but 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 meanwhile there were people at his table who were working there who were dealing with all the other stuff yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, it's funny because one of the quotes I always remember is Mozart. He had a mm. quote. He wrote it in German, but he said, "The idea that I don't work hard is a myth. I write as a sow piddles." I Meaning, he write. I guess pigs urinate a lot. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah. I, I didn't know that pigs urinate a lot. Yeah, but, but I sure. guess that's what it meant. But he meant that he wrote all the time, and he and his first, the first music he made, people say was actually pretty simplistic. Yeah. But he said he studied everything about musicians and musicians and all the different musicians he liked. He said he studied everything about their style. And he had obviously a great amount of talent, but it's yeah. a combination of things. You know, it's, it's talent is often just the ability to be good if you work hard at the thing. I heard the same about Bach, uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, another famous composer. But like, he was like, apparently he had a lot of songs that were critically slammed, like they didn't think they were that good, uh -huh. but he was only remembered for his 
great songs like the really good ones that he just were like a home run yeah and he's only remembered for them and not the ones where he didn't quite get it right and i think that's very true like people remember you for your successes and they'll yeah. usually forget your losses as long as you didn't do anything too <laughs> too damning in your in yeah. your losses yeah it's fascinating how history works like that you know like when we look back we often have a um rosy perception of things because we only remember the high points yeah and it makes it hard to envision the way history really was and all the boring stuff that happened yeah yeah and that's why that i think happened. journalism is really important because that's not tainted by nostalgia and things like that Oh, it's, it's tainted, just not by that. It's yeah. tainted by other things, but <laughs> I suppose if you could you know, cross-reference, then yeah. uh, you get you get something that's a little bit more truthful. Yeah, I, I, I'm actually, one of the videos that I did that I really liked that not a lot of people have seen is the one on, I did a thing called the Propaganda Series. Dude, I've been, I wanted to ask you if you're going to do more of the Propaganda Series. Yeah, yeah, I am. Oh, um, excellent. The video on, does the news lie to us? Mm. Like I watched that again last year and I was like, damn, I did a good job on this video because <laughs> I didn't remember it, but not a lot of people saw it. But that goes into how the media became started through natural selection. The journalists who give you the most sensationalistic stuff that you click on are the ones that survive. Mm. Even if you start out as an honest journalist, you get weeded out if you don't play the game. Yeah. You know, like same thing on YouTube. If I'm not clickbaiting enough, I end up with not a lot of views. So the people who do that are the ones that survive and that becomes the, the standard. Yeah. What I'm probably going to do is like every now and then I'll write a paper or basically it's an article, but you know, I put on preprint sites and I'm going to do one on that stuff I talked about in that series. And I'll either call it a logical explanation of human irrationality or two phenomena that underlie all human irrationality, irrationality. Mm. And I can talk about that stuff and how the, the part about how we confuse our feelings, confuse one feeling for the other creates yeah. what most people think is irrational behavior. So I'll get to talk about all kinds of stuff like that. Nice. I actually wrote a quite a similar topic of thesis when I was at university. Uh -huh. My chosen thesis was subjectivity in film, or uh -huh. more accurately, like why objectivity is a myth in film. Like you cannot be yeah. objective about your filmmaking even if you try. Like the act right, of yeah. pointing a camera in a certain direction and turning it on is at a certain point in time you're, you're choosing to turn it on then even that is subjective and the compass you use to judge your work depends on all kinds of personal things that you yeah. can't turn off you can either the only thing you can do is guess how you would have felt if you weren't influenced by those things and that's yeah. not necessarily an accurate guess and i think being self-aware is, is is also good like if you identify something then it, it kind of lessens the effect of that thing that it has on your subconscious mind um, oh yeah that's like, one of the things i'll tell you something yeah. that I, I never haven't done any videos on yet but i have things i call uncertainty principles mm. and it's a list of things that make it hard to recognize what might be going on and one of them is if you tell someone how they feel about something it'll change how they feel about that thing yeah you know well it like usually I, disarms someone from from that feeling yeah 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 it does that too because one thing is your brain will turn off your feelings if somebody threatens you yeah. but if somebody says oh you like that character because or, or you like this character because I don't know, he, he, he rides a horse and you used to ride a horse, it'll actually make you not want to look predictable. Mm. Yeah. So you instinctively, your feelings will change and you'll, you, you might claim you don't like, the per don't like the character like that, but it'll also even change how you see the character themselves. Yeah. So all of that factors into how we react to things. And it's, when you actually study it, it's really fascinating. If you force yourself to try to understand what's actually in front of you instead of just what you want to be or what seems simple, you, you'll find all kinds of things. Those things might be simple too, but they, they'll usually be different than what you imagined and they can be really interesting. Yeah, it's kind of on balance for me because I, I am quite a optimistic person uh -huh. by by my nature, but I'm also, I also want to be realistic enough to be able to see things, to, to be able to see things and not, and not fool myself a lot of the time yeah. but yeah it, it's a, it's a tricky balance because you got to have you got to have at least a vision of how things are good or could be good so that you can yeah. go towards that and, and strive yeah. to it yeah it, it's good though because understanding how things are will really help you make them how you want them to be yeah you know like the first step in alcoholics anonymous is you have to admit you have a problem <laughs> very true yeah I, I, fortunately i haven't I'm not an alcoholic or anything <laughs> i just know that from having read about it everyone you know? knows that that one yeah, yeah. Yeah, you have to you have to admit that you you had a problem. And people, 
you know, I saw this thing, and I'm, I'm not going to name names again, but I saw these scientists on this podcast, and they were saying, science is great. If there's a good idea, they'll grab at it. And I'm like, that's not true at all. That's <laughs> that's one of the most irresponsible things I've heard somebody say. You told them, watch my Einstein video. <laughs> exactly. I, I, they're in the documentary, and the documentary says in the beginning that when Einstein published that work, nobody cared. Yeah. And it's and he published it in 1905, and in, two, in 1909, he was still working at the patent office. I think the scientific community has the intention, though, for it to be a meritocracy. Well, it's it's the thing I call the evil eye. I did a video called The Eye of the Storm, right? And that can be very dastardly, and it can lead to bad things. And I call it the evil eye because it'll lead somebody to say to you, all we want is a good idea, you know? <laughs> yeah. You, you, you get to a bunch of classes or maybe a bunch of animators, and you say, hey, look, you show me a good movie, and I'll hire you, Yeah. right? And that's the evil eye because it ain't true. And the person who's telling that to you doesn't realize that, that it's not true because in their emotions and their experience, it seems true because they don't know what emotional processes in their mind make them identify what's good. Mm. And the processes that make them identify what's good include social momentum, who recommends it to them, and so on. And if you take those things away, just like the Einstein's papers, they'll just ignore it. Yeah. You know? I I've actually have a really good example of, of this happening because I was I've been on both sides of employment as an animator. I've been yeah. the employee and I've been the employer, at least yeah. in freelancing, not in yeah. I, I haven't really had enough experience in studios. I'm more of a lone wolf. But like yeah. when I've hired people, it's it's quite interesting. I put out a, a work call a, a, a tweet that was just like i'm looking for an animator that, that works in my software uh -huh. send me your email send me your stuff you know uh -huh. yeah and i got a few different ones and one of them i had an application that was that said it one of the first lines of it was i've interned at pixar uh -huh. which is impressive like that's really cool uh -huh. and i didn't choose that person uh -huh. And they probably thought that that was the most, the, the best thing they could have put on there. And it, it, yeah. it was impressive. Uh -huh. But because of that thing, I didn't choose them. Because oh, you thought they had too many opportunities? Yeah, I thought they, they're going to be distracted by all the opportunities uh -huh. coming their way. They're not, yeah. they're going to also ask for, for way higher wages because, <laughs> you know, because they're in California. Yeah. Like, and yeah. it ended up all these factors that they probably did not they did not see them because if they didn't see them, they, you know, they wouldn't have put it in their thing, but all these things that they did not predict actually stopped yeah. them from getting the commission. Yeah. 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 That makes sense. I mean, people don't realize everything that's going on. And, and, and that's the thing is when people say, Oh, we just want somebody who's good. Or we, when we see a good idea, we grab at it and it turns out not to be true. That's an example of not seeing the world for how it is. And so you can't change it. Yeah. You're always going to be subject. You're going to be a sitting duck for that problem because your back is turned on it. Yeah. You know, it, it's it's the it's the it's the problems you don't see that kill you. Yeah. I I you know? well I should add to that previous story that there were other reasons as well. Like there yeah. were over a dozen different people in there, so uh -huh. I it was the odds were never in any of their favor to get it. Yeah. You know, yeah. It, it was it was the, the odds were already always stacked against yeah. them. Yeah. And I, I always say to people, the moment you apply to something, you're putting yourself in a unfavorable odds. Oh, I know that. Yeah. And you've got to change it. the system yeah. to be so that it's likely that you get hired. Yeah. And you look at people making the decision, how they might make the decision. Yeah. And if you look at your own decisions and who you liked and why, you might find that you were taking into account things you didn't realize. Mm. Like one of the few things that I put as a consider when I was working as a, as a reader was a, a script called Southland Tales. Yeah. Now, Southland Tales was by Richard Kelly, who directed Donnie Darko. Right. Richard Kelly was a guy who went to film school. He did really weird stuff. He was kind of young. Okay. I liked Richard Kelly because he was close to my age. And he's mm. older than me, but he, 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 his success meant that people in my generation could succeed. Yeah. And Donnie Darko was an interesting movie, but Donnie Darko is not the most well-written movie. He has fantastic yeah. ideas, but it's totally confusing. He's, you know, <laughs> if you listen to the DVD commentary on it with Kevin Smith, Kevin Smith's making fun of him. He's like, you're confused by your own movie. <laughs> but because of, I realized when I looked back at all my decisions over the years, I recommended that script because of that stuff. Mm. You know, I was excited yeah. about it because of all the other things going on. Now, you know, the movie itself ended up having interesting ideas, but it did get made and it had The Rock in it and a bunch of famous actors and it yeah. didn't make a lot of money. And that's not to criticize something for not making a lot of money. It's just to point out that my own instincts were influenced by things that turned out not to make the movie successful. So my own recommendation was, was warped. 
mm. because I didn't realize that. So it's fascinating sometimes to look at your own reactions because that's the black box that you yourself have access to. Yeah. And that's the interesting thing about like how someone's feeling at the time that they watch something or, or that they consume it. Because I actually had, well, I, I get a lot of questions about what to put in your portfolio and also like yeah. what, what you should do for a film, you know, a film yeah. entry. What's the thing that's going to give it the edge? I go yeah. through all the, all the normal points, the usual points that make total sense. And yeah. then I also say, oh, and by the way, see if you can make them laugh. Because yeah. if you can tell a joke, and they laugh, they will feel good and they will associate that good feeling with you. And yep. so it, it's literally like, it's like Pavlov's dog. When they hear your name, yep. they'll be like, they, it, they will start smiling because you made them laugh once. They will, all those, you know, the good associations and the uh, the dopamine and, and what have you, it's yep. all linked to you now and your name. So yep. yeah, making them laugh, that's, a, that's just a, it's a really quick hack and it's like, it's unfair but yeah. it works it's, you know like and film festivals as well that's one of the things i noticed about me watching films at film festivals the ones uh, that made me laugh did so well and they didn't even have to be as good as the yeah. as the other ones no yeah it, it's hard to make people laugh a lot of the time yeah but but sometimes you can make people laugh for reasons you don't intend to mm, yeah true i yeah i saw an actor I, I don't remember which actor it was i don't think it was leonardo dicaprio but i was reading about some actor and she was talking about how one of the ways she got her first acting job was that when she went in, she had something caught in her eye at the end of it, yeah. and she, the director thought she winked at it. <laughs> and it wasn't, it wasn't because she, no was, it wasn't way. because she was, it wasn't because he thought she was flirting or anything like that. He just thought she was like cocky like that. <laughs> and because of that, she, she said she stood out in his mind, and he ended up hiring her. Wow, that's that's an incredible story. Yeah, but it shows you that when, when you bring in a bunch of people and none of them have any extra social things or other emotions to recommend them, you end up making random decisions that are based on things that just give you any emotional boost at all. Yeah, yeah. And there's a guy, uh, this isn't a book recommendation, but it's something that I think people should check out. Like I spent a lot of time trying to figure out where other people have thought about and talked about some of the things I found, especially the idea that people have multiple things affecting their emotions when they watch movies and things. Yeah. One of the earliest example I found was a guy named Louis Cheskin in the 1950s and 60s. And if you look him up, you can look up his name on Wikipedia, but his actual idea, he used it to sell margarine in cars, was that people, when he did a study, he found that people would buy more margarine depending on what the package was and how the package looked, and that mattered more than how the margarine even tasted. Yeah. And it's mentioned in a Malcolm Gladwell book. And in, in the Malcolm Gladwell book, he kind of guesses that people seem to taste the label on things. Mm. But I found that it's not that they taste the label. It's that they just rate their overall emotional experience. And that takes into account those things. Yeah. Now, Cheskin's idea is, to be honest, if they knew the significance of that idea, I think he should have won a Nobel Prize. But his idea today is so obscure that it doesn't even have a Wikipedia page. Wow. You have to look up Cheskin himself. And then there's a paragraph on his page that mentions the idea. He called it sensation transference. But that's where you'll read about it. But the way he described it is exactly the thing I noticed and then talked about too. But he did it in advertising. So yeah. that's, that's interesting to read about. It's only a paragraph or two on his page, but you can you can look I've that up. I've heard a similar thing where they say that the ultimate marketing test is bottled water. Oh, can you sell the, water? Yeah, because they are literally selling the exact same thing. And they're all next to each other. They're all lined up next to each other. Perfect. It's, it's the exact same thing. It's the perfect like control variable, I suppose. It's perfect example of a product that's not even really a product yeah yep well i and suppose it, it is in the lo the location that water is in like if you're selling water in a desert <laughs> you know that is yeah, a well, service that is a real thing that you're providing you know yeah well that's that's different because that's food and you have some other things to judge it by besides just how you feel about it you know you need to eat yeah but 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 as it as an example that's that's a perfect example of how the way you're judging is not based on the product it's similar to one that i started using recently which was blank canvases and art Mm. people will buy blank canvases for large amounts of money. And it's fantastic because if you go to certain YouTube channels that are about art, they and you, and you look up or you just Google blank canvas sold at auction, you'll see YouTube mm. videos come up that try to explain to you why people bought it. Yeah. And you'll have people telling you, well, this artist, they use this shade of white and it suggests this. Yeah. And some people say, well, I could have done that. Yeah, but you didn't do it first and it's important. <laughs> and this person thought of it first. All this ridiculous stuff. But it shows you, no, they say that about like a canvas where the guy painted it red and then it sold for $100,000 or, yeah. or millions of dollars, really. But the great thing about a blank canvas is you can't even make that argument. You can't even say that it's the shade of, you can't even say 
that it's the shade of white that the person used because there's nothing on the canvas at all and it's still sold. And it's just like the bottled water. It shows you that it's about the extra emotional factors because there's nothing else that you could even say is there. Yeah. So stuff like that is fantastic examples if you really want to get a hint about what people are buying and so on. Yeah, the the canvas one and the, that type of art, you know, the the one that's that annoys most people, <laughs> including myself. And they're people are right. They're yeah. right to be. Oh right. yeah, they they are. And yeah. but the the interesting thing about that, I think, is that all of the work is done by the person looking at it, not the person making it. Exactly. Like the, they have to go to extraordinary efforts to yep. explain why something is valuable. Meanwhile, yep. the 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 artist yep. can just cross their arms. Yep, and and, and that's that's funny because when Kevin Smith was doing that DVD commentary with with Rich with Richard Richard Kelly, yeah, that's one of the things he brought up. Is he said, you know, people make all because they were talking about Donnie Darko, and if you remember Donnie Darko, people make all kinds of interpretations of it because it's confusing. Okay. Yeah. But Kevin Smith said, and this makes perfect sense, I agree with it, people think about all this stuff and read all this stuff into what you did, but really you're just sitting there writing stuff and you don't think about that at all. You just think about something that would be cool. <laughs> they think about it more than the writer. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> people will, it's like how people see patterns in clouds. If they, but if people like what you, if people like what they see, they'll try to figure out why they like it. Mm. They'll end up trying to study, I call it the merit myth. They think that there's something on that screen that's magically creating all their emotional reactions. And there are things on the screen that create your emotional reactions, but sometimes you'll, 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 you can see without a doubt that the canvas is blank, but you're still <laughs> reacting to it. So you know, if you, if you look at it that way, you can tell without a doubt that it's not just what's on that screen. But when people get stuck looking at only the screen or looking at only what's on the canvas, that's when you get people analyzing the pigments that Rembrandt used and he used number six green and this and, Vermeer used lapis lazuli blue, I think they say, which is this really rare type of blue. Who gives a damn? <laughs> yeah, yeah. It'll if, be a slightly you, different shade. Yeah, if you change the shade of blue in in Vermeer's painting, that would have no effect whatsoever on people wanting to buy it. And yeah. the truth is, okay, people have done the studies. You can take an artist like Banksy, who yeah. I, did a, I did a video on Banksy. His stuff is bought for millions of dollars now. They took, Banksy himself did it. He took his stuff, put it on the street corner, I think in New York, and called it spray art and charged $40 for it. And people walked by and in an hour, like 90% of people didn't care. Yeah. So what are we actually looking at here? You change the lapis lazuli in the paint and nobody wants to, ch nobody, it doesn't change who wants to buy and who doesn't. You change how people see the painting and all of a sudden everything switches in terms of who wants to buy it and for how much money. And, and, and the example I always, the other example I use is the forger, the art forger, Han Van Meegeren, mm. who who was really frustrated because he clearly was a brilliant artist. If you look at some of his sketches, the guy was fantastic, but nobody wanted to buy his art. And he got so frustrated that he started forging paintings. And he didn't know this. I mean, I'll say this really quickly. It looks like Vermeer used mirrors, painted with mirrors. There's a movie called Tim's Vermeer, which is really good, mm. where he recreates one of Vermeer's painting using, using this device with mirrors. And... Van Meegeren didn't know that. And Van Meegeren painted a Vermeer from sight, like from his memory, yeah. which takes an incredible amount of talent, of course, to do it from imagination. Whereas, you know, when you're working from mirrors, you have an image in front of you. Yeah. But what happened was Van Meegeren made a Vermeer painting, a fake Vermeer painting, and put it out in the art gallery and people thought it was real. And one of the art critics wrote a review of it and said it was the best Vermeer he'd ever seen. <laughs> So the same thing. You take Banksy and put him on the street corner. Nobody wants to buy it. You take the guy who nobody wants to buy, put the name Vermeer on it, and all of a sudden, it's not just as good as Vermeer. The guy, the art critics who are experts in Vermeer think it's better than anything Vermeer did. I mean, how how much more evidence do you need? And that's a really profound thing to me, you know? Yeah. There is something to do with supply and demand there. And, and I don't know, maybe like flowers are a good example. Just, you know, you can find flowers anywhere and they yeah. are, in a way, they, they kind of transcend anything that, that a human could create. But but they're plentiful and there's no shortage of them they're, and they're easy to find and they just spontaneously grow. And so they are not worth all that much. You might have to yeah. buy some seeds and that might cost yeah. a little bit, but... Yeah, and then the rare flowers, some of the rarest flowers look really ugly, and <laughs> but but they're very rare, and because of that, yeah. they sell for a lot of money. Yeah, yeah, it's, 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 it's 
it's the value of it as a possession. Yeah. You know, and that's it's funny because that was something that, that was really interesting to me when I found out about it was the idea that once you get a certain number of things in life, you can't get pleasure anymore because you have too much stuff. And that's when people that's why rock stars all end up messing around with drugs. Yeah. Because they, they, they've had all the girls, they've had all the uh, all the fame, you know, all the money. Yeah. They have all the attention. And for them in their life, there's nothing else. There's nowhere else for them to go. Yeah. And so, you know, they have to artificially stimulate their pleasure. And, and that's what they end up doing. Now, other people who have different tastes, what they do is they say, well, how can I be continue to gain status? How can I make myself feel better? How can I get to a better place in life? And to do that, you have to have more than the other rich guy. Yeah. And people have come out and said that. Like, I, I had a quote in a video, which I think I, I should have put a subtitle I, on. I remember that bit in the video. That blew my mind, what you said about arts. Could you, could you say what? Yeah, sorry. You're probably about to get to that. Well, the, the quote I was going to mention was Martin Shkreli, who's worth like $10, $20 million. And, you know, he pissed a bunch of people off. He's the pharmaceutical guy, pharma, pharma bro. But he mentioned when they were, I have a, an outtake from his interview, one of the interviews he did, where he talked about why he bought the Wu-Tang album for $2 million. Mm. And he said, there's a lot of stuff rich guys buy to just prove and whose is bigger. <laughs> and in the video, it's not really clear. I should have put subtitle on it so you could see what he was saying. But, or he says to prove, and then the interviewer says, whose is bigger? And he says, exactly, that's what I'm trying to say. And that, that's one of the things that confirmed to me that, yeah, you do it so that you get that feeling of, I got to another place in life and that reactivates your happiness when you're like in the state of mind where you're like, you can't get anywhere. It's, it's, it's almost yeah. torturous. I think you might have said like two theories of how, you know, those really obscenely expensive piece of art, pieces of art. One of them was like that it's a sort of tax evasion thing for, for rich people. And the other one is that <laughs> they literally, you know, money, they all have money. So they're looking for other ways to one up each other. And if yeah. you buy, you know, there's only one of a, an original painting yep. so it's yep. like it, who who gets to it first that's their yeah. new sort of goal and it's a way that they can spend this money yeah i remember the I said, if you're not going to do drugs then it's like a game that you finished yeah 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 you have to find a way to get better and i and i got that really great picture that i was happy about of the two bentleys next to each other i think it was <laughs> and and the and the mcmansion where they start criticizing each other's taste and all that so <laughs> It's all it's all about that and, and people's psychology can be really interesting like that and that but that that to me I love because it's it's what I think is a satisfying answer to a question that everybody wonders about mm, yeah. You know and, and maybe people don't agree with me. I'm just giving my own opinion I'm happy when I find something like that because then I'm like, okay I can show people that that instinct you had that something wasn't right with that art world where people are spending 200 million dollars on that canvas you know, like it's not a bad painting, but you're really telling yeah. me that there's something that guy did that somehow made that worth $200 million and how he yeah. painted the canvas. It doesn't feel right to people. And to be able to say, you're right, there's a reason it doesn't feel right because yeah. that's not where the power comes from. Let me show you something that makes sense. That's the kind of thing I'm most happy about. Yeah, you you just explained something that yeah. a lot of people are just, just don't have a clear answer to. Yeah, everybody knows that there's something wrong. Yeah. It but, annoys but find, them, and they yeah. they don't have an explanation. Maybe that's partly why it annoys them, it's because it's it's such yeah. a it's you sort know. of like a, a glitch in yeah. reality to them. Yeah, and, and and that's one thing that drives me nuts is because okay, there's certain YouTube channels, okay, and and the name might sound like Pox, but it might start with a different letter, and they'll, they'll they do a video they did a video that has almost the exact same title as one of mine, and it's why did the Da Vinci painting sell for this amount of money, and you watch that video. And it doesn't tell you anything. Mm. By the time the five minutes is over, you haven't learned anything about why that painting sold. It has flashy motion graphics, though. <laughs> yeah, and okay, if you click their video and watch it, by the time it's over, you, you got they got the watch time out of you. Yeah. So as far as the YouTube algorithm... There I go with YouTube again. <laughs> as far as the algorithm is concerned, they got the view, but you didn't get anything out of it yourself. So, you know, and then, and then what, can you, what can someone else do if you're actually answering the question that doesn't actually help you? Because YouTube, the, the, the YouTube thing doesn't know. It just knows that people watched. Yeah. But, but, but there's a new thing that they, I've noticed where they have something that comes up on your main page where they say, you recently watched this video and gave it a thumbs up. What would you rate this video out of five stars? Have you seen that yet? I haven't actually seen that, but because I avoid the homepage all the time, oh. I go straight to my profile so I don't get distracted. 
Yeah, I, I probably should do that. But they say, you rate this video out of five stars. And then they say, why did you rate this video that, why did you give this video that rating? And you can choose helpful, informative, life-changing, whatever. Mm. And then I said, okay, maybe they're experimenting with going back to giving people other ways to rate videos. Mm. Because IMDb has this fantastic thing, the, the, the user rating. I, I, I think that IMDb, whatever their system is, it works because the IMDb top 250, they are Fantastic. solid films. They're all Fantastic. solid. Nothing gets there by mistake unless it's yep. like, I remember that like, I think uh, Infinity War was like near the top of that when it first came out. And so I was like, Wonderful. okay, it, it's, yeah. it also takes relevance <laughs> into account because it had just yeah. come out. It, it, it adjusts itself over time. Yeah. Yeah. I'm sure it's, it's not there now, you know? Yeah. And I, I love that thing so much that if I think something's not good and it has a higher user rating than I think, I, I, I go back to it and look at it again. But mm. it's cool now because, like, I can almost call the user rating without looking at it. Oh, really? Like, I could tell, yeah, like, um, I saw Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and I was like, that seems like about a 7.9. <laughs> and I think it was like an 8 when it first came out or 8.1. Now like, it's pretty close. At, at, yeah. I think it's exactly 7.9 or 7.8. So I can tell. But, the, but it's fantastic because it uses the wisdom of crowds. Yeah, yeah. And that's that's another book I would recommend to people that I did actually read. Yeah, you you whole... put like a little picture in that video you did of the wisdom of crowds, which was like like I, I don't know maybe like eight hundred people guessed the weight yes. of a of an bull? of a bull. Yeah, and, and they, they were got like it within one pound. Yeah, like one they were one pound off. Yep. And and there's I, an... I was literally thinking about that in the park today when I was like jogging around the park. It's like that's incredible <laughs> it is but 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 once you understand it it's, it's even more interesting yeah because um what it does is everybody has errors in how they think about things right but when you can give a when you can have a situation like that where people can give a number the errors are essentially random yeah if the errors don't go in any specific direction if everybody doesn't tend to overestimate or doesn't tend to underestimate it's just all a random error yeah. the more people you ask those errors cancel out yeah, like someone who underestimates will be countered by someone who overestimates in the exactly. same amount. Exactly. And another example of that is if you listen to concerts, music concerts, mm. when the singer holds the microphone out to the audience, the audience is better than the singer. Yeah, they actually they actually get to the right notes. Yep, they're perfect. If you listen, the audience's voice is usually perfect. That's true. The, yeah. the collective voice of the audience, because the people who can't sing all can't sing in different ways. <laughs> so the, some people sing too high some people sing too low some people sing too fast some people sing too slow yeah but with enough people there the only thing that's common amongst them is the correct note some people get close to the correct note and you take all those voices together and what you hear is the average of those voices which is basically the perfect vocal performance on the song that's blowing my mind it's a great it, example yeah yeah and, and i I downloaded a clip from that recently. I don't know which video I'm going to use it in. Maybe this next video. But that shows you that that's what's great about this is that once you get enough people together doing something, an individual person, I can't understand, right? I think it's really hard, but that's what psychologists do, which is why I say I don't really do psychology because that's too hard for me. Right. But if you get 10, 20, 30 people together, 100, 1,000, to where all the in unpredictable stuff becomes random, then you start to see patterns. Mm. And you can understand it logically. And that to me is what's utterly fascinating because I like logic and patterns. And, and then you can see it in people. Yeah. So, and the IMDb user rating does that. Yeah. It, it takes into account. Some people vote 10, some people vote 1. But those people cancel each other out. And what you actually get is the ratio of 10s to 1s, which is one of the things it takes into account. Yeah. And so you, you end up with this really nuanced, nuanced rating, which... So it's it's fantastic, and, and I love that user rating. I, I hope they keep it. <laughs> yeah, I I usually look at the to the top. You know, if you look at the top five, then it, mm -hmm. that that's like even more concentrated in its in its sort of like it's it's, it's got to be more specific there. Like, okay, yeah. there's five that's made it into the top five, mm -hmm. and like and then there's like between second place and first place. Okay, now it's literally deciding like that like the difference between the two and like some yep. kind of Shaw idea of quality like shawshank redemption and the godfather i think are the top are the number one and two i think yeah yeah both, and lord of the rings great. lord of the rings was return of the king was up there for a while but then that went down what a number one when i was first studying imdb like this is around me oh five oh six it was shawshank redemption godfather godfather 2 and lord of the rings 
Yeah. And then when the when the Dark Knight came out, Dark Knight I think was number one or two for a while. You can go on web.archive.org and look at old versions of the top two fifty if you want to. Yeah. Um, but it, you, I can't complain with with any of those choices. You know, they they are no, all they are all excellent films. Yeah. Yeah. Shawshank Redemption. It's funny because I watched it and I understood that it was really well written, but I wasn't quite clear on how it affected people. But mm. what I did was I watched a fan version of the movie called the shark tank redemption which is about guys who work at a movie company or who work at a production company or an agency i don't remember i've never heard of when it. i got when i got done watching that it's on um the dvd for shawshank redemption i think and it's probably on youtube when i got done watching that i said holy shit, that was really profound and that like made my day watching the shark tank redemption then i said oh that must be what people see in shawshank redemption i don't know why that is sometimes i have to watch a cover before I'll get why people like something. I didn't understand why people liked Stairway to Heaven until I listened to the Dolly Parton version. Then I was like, wow, that's a great song. And then I then I got it. So I don't know what that is, but yeah. Watch Shark Tank Redemption. I highly recommend it. I used a clip from Shark Tank Shark Tank Redemption in the um Harry Potter video when I show Morgan Freeman's son who plays the who plays uh, Red, the 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 equivalent of Red in that movie, sending out his screenplay over and over. Oh right. Yeah, I must have yeah. missed that. Yeah, it's it's because you, if you haven't seen it, you wouldn't recognize where the clip's from. But yeah, oh, yeah. I just right. went off on a tangent there. <laughs> yeah, pretty fun tangent though, especially yeah. it was these films that 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 we both really love. I I think we yeah we we do certainly cross over on on film taste. Yeah, in these ones. Can I ask you a question? Yeah, of course. Okay, I read the Daily Mail every day, and I've gotten multiple a lot of people who wanted to talk to me. Like the 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 there's a book that's out in the UK that actually has a little section that's about me. I, I talked to the guy who, um, it's about marketing, but the guy liked my channel. He's he's British. Yeah. And I, I did some stuff with Creative Screenwriting Magazine and the editor there is British. So I don't know what it is about people in the UK, but people in the UK seem to like my channel. I'm not sure why that is. <laughs> I have no idea why that would be. Yeah, I, I'm not really sure. I, is it, it? Have you looked in the uh, audience demographics? I have at one point. I haven't looked at it in a long time. I probably should check and see. It's, it might be because of some kind of economic factors. Because I, I know for my channel, I'm quite I'm quite popular with like Indonesians and like Philippines and Portuguese and yeah. and and some Brazilians as well. And and I wasn't sure why, but there's usually some kind of reason. Like they just opened up a university of the arts in, oh. in the Philippines or something like that, you know. And then that's that's what does it. That's that's what kind of uh, pushes it a bit higher. Yeah. It's, so, uh, I, I think that maybe I think that maybe in the UK people have a different attitude about educational material maybe maybe because one of the problems that I think I have is that my videos are kind of impersonal like I don't talk much about myself and I I know that's part of how it's people take things ideas, in ideas I think yeah. like, like you, your channel is like full of ideas like I yeah. feel like I get a new idea I like an interesting idea every on every video I, I click on. Yeah, that's what I try to do. I try to have something in there that, that, that people might find really interesting every time. Yeah, and I go for that. Like, I really go for that. That stimulates me. Yeah. But I'm not sure if that's what what everyone likes. I think if you look at vlogs, like a typical yeah. vlog, they don't do that. They they That's not why people watch a vlog. It's actually, it's, yeah. it's more of like to, to have personal. a friend. It's like... Yeah. They they imagine that person as a friend, yeah, someone they already know. Yeah, and that, that that's something like yeah. When you watch Instagram, like those Instagram stories and Instagram yeah. chats, it's all people talking to their friends, whatever. And apparently, people like to watch that too. And and mukbangs. Have you seen a mukbang? No. What's that? A mukbang is a fancy term for somebody eating on camera. Oh. And people will watch that, and it's just like having dinner with somebody else. That's weird. That is weird. Yeah. I've seen yeah. like a guy destroys like a. 20 donuts in one sitting and like but that one or, or there's one that's that like that one one was like the one that i found really good was a guy eats michael phelps's diet in one sitting uh, <laughs> like his daily his daily diet in one sitting and it was it was disgusting but it was like <laughs> wow he can really put that food away so that one i can understand like because yeah. you're, you're literally like will he eat it will he make it <laughs> Yeah, I I think a mukbang is literally just not even anything interesting. I just have a couple yeah. burgers and fries, and I'm having dinner. And I'm gonna eat that, eat that, and talk. And people will watch it. So to me, I'm always like, well, okay, like maybe I should try to have some more personal element. But it's just not like I'm so 
I feel like hyperactive, like I'm always trying to have so much stuff I want to say that I never have time to say anything about myself. Yeah. You know, but I feel like maybe people in the UK just are don't care as much or, or more interested in ideas or something like that. I'm not sure why. I'm not sure. Um, but it's funny because Stanley Kubrick, the director, he had very impersonal movies. Yeah, he did. Stanley Kubrick moved to the UK. And I was thinking about that today and yesterday. I was like, I wonder if that's something similar. I don't know if there's... He's a bit of an, an anomaly in many ways. You know, there were <laughs> lots of things about him that you wouldn't necessarily expect. Like yeah. his favorite show was The Simpsons and stuff. And then you're like, oh, maybe he was an ordinary guy after all but then you find out something else about him you'd be like yeah, yeah he was weird <laughs> is he po- is he popular over there was he more popular than, than he might be in the in america i, I don't know i think he's i think he's proportionately popular I, I don't think it's i don't think he's especially popular with with people oh, oh. well i'm not sure what it is because i like to read the uk news too i'm not sure why why, I why the mail i'm just interested in why it's I, that's, you know why I like it? Because the comment section has tons of people in it. So you oh so you're reading it online? I read it online, yeah. Honestly, it's man, I I it's hard. People hate it. I know. Yeah, I know it's people trash. Hate the Daily Mail. <laughs> it's basically like it's a tabloid. It is trash. Yeah. But like, it's fun because if you go to the comment section, like, there's thousands of comments on stuff, so you can just like talk to people in the UK and share your opinion on whatever's going on over there. Yeah. And you can't normally do that. Like, you might have to go to, like, UK politics or whatever, but yeah. I don't know. It, it, it's I don't know. People seem more interested in educational stuff. Like, I've been trying to talk to people at different educational places to see if they're interested in helping me publish some of my ideas, that kind of thing. And when you contact places in the U.S., people might get back to you, but most people just don't even respond to the email. I contacted a place called the Center for Research in Arts, Social Sciences, and Humanities. CRASH is the acronym. Yeah. In Cambridge. And of like the 16 people I, who I talked to, like five emailed me back within like an hour. What was the really, exact uh, kind of proposal you gave? I, I sent a message out saying just looking for something, looking for something useful to do with my work on books, movies, and, and the brain. And I say I'm looking, but I don't know anyone who's on who's in academia, and I'd like to publish, look to meet somebody or publish or develop some of my work, for, you know, to publish in academic yeah. journals, or things like that. And I include some links to you know places where I've been covered and some articles I've written and that kind of stuff. And so that's the thing I'm trying to do this year. And like I said, I heard back from four or five people. They directed me to the film division there or whatever. So I'll email somebody there. But people there are very polite and they, they seem to take more care when they talk to you. You know, they're, so I, I like that. Yeah, it's not, I, I think, well, it's, it's hard for me to say, but I, I think for me, looking at Hollywood and uh-huh. the culture of Hollywood, to me, it feels very alien in many ways. Yeah. So I can only say that, yes, it is different here. It is different <laughs> in ways I don't quite know because yeah. how can a fish describe water? Are you in Cal? You said you were in California before. Where are you now? I, I visited California very briefly just to meet huh. a few friends out there and go to a convention. I'm, I'm in London huh. now. I'm, I'm at oh, uh, okay. outer London. Yeah. Okay. All, all I can say is like the film festivals here in the UK are pretty cool. And so there is a film, there is an indie film scene and stuff if you're interested in that. And I went to University of Portsmouth and did my degree in animation there. And it was good, you know, it was really nice. One other place that I've been to that I studied at for a year to get a foundation degree in art and design was uh, uh, Farnham, uh, University of Creative Arts Farnham uh, or UCA. And um, th- them as an institution, they're really good. They are seen by people as being a little bit snobby a little bit sort of pretentious because they have a sort of rich history of yeah. a lot of great artists, people like, you know, uh, like the founders of Ardman Animation, like Nick Park and people, they studied yeah. there. I mean, yeah. actually, you know what? Ardman's not even pretentious. So I, I don't know why they have the reputation like that, oh. but they they are great. And um, I, I'd ask there, really, UCA. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it's funny because when you do a lot of research, like... In the Einstein video, one of the things I did was I showed just a, on screen for a couple seconds, I had a, a bunch of people who were really good at something they did, right? But they had trouble getting recognized. And I paired them with the person who helped them get recognized. Like, for example, I had Isaac Newton yeah. and Edmund Halley. Edmund Halley was the person who paid to publish Isaac Newton's book on mathematics. 
Yeah. The Royal Society at the time was publishing a book on fishes, so they didn't care. <laughs> and Edmund Halley paid out of his pocket. So I had Edmund, I used Edmund Halley and Isaac Newton. I used, there's a mathematician called Ramana John, who um, a guy named G.H. Hardy helped him out. I, I had them paired together and um, just a bunch of stuff like that. And it's funny because when I, when I research stuff like that, I'm like, you know, a lot of times people in the UK help out people like that who have intellectual ideas when other places won't help them. So I, I, that's something I appreciate about the UK, I'll say Maybe that. Maybe it is like uh, there's a higher proportion, but there's also, you know, I think anywhere you go, mm-hmm. there are, you know, ev- every country has their idiots. Yeah. Every country has <laughs> their sort of like apathetic people who don't really care who just are in it for themselves and planks. So, i know yeah. all the terms planks donkeys right muffins. <laughs> right yeah so yeah. i don't know maybe there's a slightly bigger uh, proportion i do think that like structures and institutions do help certain people rise you know like uh, a yeah. certain type of person like a certain society helps to like if I, i'm thinking about american psycho i really like that film i find it hilarious for one thing he was but... the first I, I tweeted a couple of days ago that i think he was the first instagrammer <laughs> right, right did you notice because in the beginning of the video he's the first the beginning of the movie he's the first person i've ever seen describe his daily routine in incredible <laughs> detail to people he didn't know yeah and he but talks then... about all the fancy stuff he has and he was american psycho <laughs> oh, so he was, he's the godfather of it's instagram but anyway, anyway what were you saying yeah yeah i was just saying that like in that you know i the scary thing about that to me was that the society the, the way civilization was allowed a psychopath to rise to the top yeah and so it, it really does it, you know culture and things like that really do have a huge impact i, I think like yeah. the wall street culture allowed people like that to rise but then we'll save that for another day though yeah i mean this listen this was a lot of fun yeah this was great man i thank you so much for giving so much of your time i'm telling you guys who are listening right now please go and check out story brain it's a really good channel like honestly i've just this was a great excuse for me to talk to you about your videos because i've watched so many of them and find them genuinely interesting and you're one of the most underrated channels i think i appreciate that and i hope that one thing that i hate is that even though i suck like with the algorithm i just hate the idea that people who might watch the channel might think that the ideas are less interesting or impactful because it has low views and that's what drives me nuts you know what before i became like a little bit bigger as a channel yeah. i yeah. took pride in the fact that i was a hidden gem like yeah. i liked the idea of being a hidden gem and yeah. that that kept me going i was like i don't care i i'm a hidden that's gem a and that's a cool thing to be yeah so keep at it and this is good it's good to talk to animators too because one of my secret dreams is like you know how they have um like those series on Netflix, like Tiger King and, and yeah. whatever, all those stuff. I would love to do a mini series on like A and E. Like in my mind, it's like Arts and Entertainment Network, A and E in the U.S. Yeah. And called The Mind in the Movies. Hmm. And then I could do like an eight, an eight, an eight episode series on different stuff, like I've talked about on the channel. And I could work with animators and people because I have so many ways I'd like to visualize some of this stuff. That'd be awesome. That that could be so cool, and like and, sh- and and so many different ways you can show. And I can only use like MS Paint. Yeah. You know. But there's so much stuff you could do that, that that I think would really... Because I would love to show like the three-dimensional way that people process things. And I'd like to take those charts I have that I made in MS Paint and maybe make those so you could do those like pyramids and stuff. I think it would be so cool. And I'd love to work with animators and stuff and just... And people who could really make it look cool. I think that would be fantastic. I think you could put something amazing so, on TV. Yeah. yeah I, like, uh, you know, a- animation is really, really good. The only hard part is making it. <laughs> ah, I love that. <laughs> That's true of so many things. Yeah. Okay, well, listen, I really enjoyed it. All and if right. you want to talk again, just hit me up. All right, great. Yeah, hopefully I'll be in contact with you. Okay, anytime, man. It's cool. Thanks for listening to this episode. Remember to head over to Story Brain and subscribe to his channel. If you want to help sustain the making of this podcast and the other videos on this channel, you can support me on Patreon. I will leave the link to that in the description. Thanks, guys. I'll see you in the next video. Goodbye.